are you? Welcome to Rediscovering Our Past, to this new podcast that we have created to delve, as the title indicates, into the possibility of a new perspective on the origins of human civilization and its development. All this thanks to the research and discoveries of the doctor in architecture, Miguel Perez Sanchez Pla, in his research, which was forged in the development of his doctorate and which was awarded with an outstanding qualification cum laude. He reconstructed the Great Pyramid of Giza with total accuracy, recreating its original form and thereby revealing a wisdom encrypted in the monument itself, articulated by different scientific disciplines, interconnected with each other, and that as he deepened his research and his work, they were appearing before Mikhail's eyes. I could tell you about it, but would be worthless, especially if he can tell it to you in person, so we will allow ourselves to in person. So today we will allow ourselves a little license in terms of the name of our video podcast and we will alter it. And we're going to alter it slightly just for today because we are interested in to rediscover its origins, the origins of Miquel, of Miquel, Perez Sanchez Pla. Hello Miquel, how good are you? Good morning, very well, thank you. And you? Well, everything is very good. I was really looking forward to interviewing you and we had been waiting for this for a long time. That's how it is. We were really looking forward to getting to know you better and above all for you to tell us about this research that interests us so much and that I'm sure is going to interest us a lot too. And so that those who see us, those who listen to us get to know you a little. Let's start from the beginning of everything. Where are your roots? Where did you grow up? Where did you develop? Look, I was born in the city of Barcelona and I grew up between Barcelona and Cervelo, a town on the outskirts of Barcelona in the Lobregat Valley about 25 kilometers away, 15 minutes now by car, which was a small wonder of nature because we had a fantastic stream of crystalline waters where we used to bathe, of crystalline waters where we used to bathe when we were children. And we also had fountains all around and a very deep pine forest. And also tree species of different types. That is to say it was my little childhood paradise. At some point when I was a child in that idyllic childhood that you mentioned, so beautiful and with the duality of being in the city, of being in the city, to also enjoy the countryside, something that is more complicated now, it's more difficult. In that beautiful childhood, did you show any interest in architecture in Egypt or in both at the same time? Let's see, it happens that I had a childhood also surrounded by books because both my father and my maternal grandfather were two intellectuals who were very fond of Love to read and at home. And at home we had a very large library. And the truth is that from that moment on, logically, logically the interest, almost decidedly for historical architecture, because what history book, in what history book can you not find the pyramids of Egypt, for example? So I think that, like so many other children, I played with the characteristic, with the characteristic construction games, but the reference was always this enigmatic set of the three pyramids and the sphinx which would later have an important influence on my decision to study architecture i was going to ask you why i was going to ask you what attracted you to architecture and you mentioned that you already you already had some inclination for construction as you just said but why did you decide to start your career was there any other alternative apart from architecture any other alternatives besides that any doubts well it's very rare that a 17 year old kid doesn't have doubts about about what to dedicate his life to, because in the end, the profession ends up occupying a very important part of his life, ends up occupying a very important part of the life of each one of us. And the truth is that I had doubts and I had serious doubts. From the point of view of letters, I was in philosophy. I liked it very much. From the point of view of physical sciences, because in some way I always, I was always worried about to try to delve into the origin of the universe, which I think are the great enigmas of our knowledge, of our knowledge or of our search for knowledge, or rather, of our search for knowledge. And on the other hand, I was also very interested in cinema. Cinema as the sum of the arts. The film school was in Madrid. On the other hand, the subject of architecture was also a discipline that merged the arts. And I think that this fact made me decide, because on the other hand, I had an artist in my family that whether you like it or not, since I was a child, having a painter, a sculptor in the family, was an important incident, which was Joseph Pla Arbola. And, and from then on, architecture ended up capturing me, and I decided to study architecture. 
I decided to study architecture, among other things, because I remember thinking to myself, look, what architects do lasts. Now, I know that it lasts for better or for worse, because our cities are not wonders of architecture, but they have very unique elements. But they have very singularizing elements. The theme of Barcelona with Gaudi is internationally known. E, not to mention the Gothic art in so many European capitals. And, well, the fact is that this idea that what architects did lasted had an immediate reference in the pyramids. Had an immediate reference in the pyramids of Egypt. Egypt, in such a way that without knowing it at the age of 17 or without perfectly aware that he would later delve deeper into this study, at the age of 17, it is a subject that already caught my attention, precisely because of its transcendence and its durability. It is an important element in the sense that it must also be a tremendous satisfaction for one to first delineate, to build. It gives the sensation that it is a creativity that has a direct translation. And then you can even go and physically touch what you finish. It is a very special feeling because, in a way, you feel like the father of the creature. In other words, we men don't give birth, but our creative works, in a way, in quotation marks, are like our children, too. He, well, intuition plays a very important role here. For me, intuition is the spark that ignites the fire of creation. Einstein considered intuition was the most important thing there was. And well then, my experience with the world of creativity plays a very important role, both in architecture and in poetry. The front of intuition, the role of intuition. And when you finish your degree, from there to your doctoral thesis is a long way off. How far? At the end of the horizon. Horizon. There is no horizon at that time. That is, when I finish my degree, I start working at the College of Architects of Catalonia in the Commission for the Defense of Architectural Heritage. And that's my first serious approach, let's say already professional, to the architectural heritage. But of course, to think then of Giza or the Great Pyramid, that is to say, one of the peaks of the world architectural heritage was a long way away from my thoughts and my possibilities. I just didn't think about it at the time, not at all, because in addition... It has its own intra-history that we will explain, that we will develop, and that we will start asking you now, and that we are starting to ask you now. You started to investigate about the Great Pyramid, but how? How? This, yes, in the most unusual way. Look, let's see. Let's see. After being in the College of Architects, which was a couple of years, I found that the deepening I had done in architectural heritage led me to commissions in the sense of protecting the architectural heritage of the different municipalities around Barcelona. Around Barcelona. I made six plans for the protection of the architectural heritage, among them the revision of the catalogue of Barcelona's Ensange. But the other side of the coin is that during these years that I dedicated myself to urban planning, architectural creativity was a little bit in parenthesis. That is to say, they were very interesting research works. But I drew less, I projected much less. And from that moment on, another vein that I did not know about began to emerge, which was writing. That is, I began to write poetry. And, uh, well, when I had a hundred poems written, I said to myself, well, if I leave it in the drawer, it's not going to be of any use to anyone. What if I took it to a publisher? And to my surprise, they publish it. I published my first book in edition 62. It was called in Catalan Miral de Mirages, which means Mirror of Mirages. And this was the first of five other books, four other books that I published later, a total of five. And, well, it turned out that one day, for my sixth book, I wanted to write a poem. I wanted to talk about the Great Pyramid. The sixth book is called Adam. It was originally called Adam, now the name has changed. And I wanted to write about the Great Pyramid, talking about the great origins of architecture. And I said to myself that an architect couldn't talk nonsense about a Great Pyramid, could he? And that what I had to do, in a way, in an absolutely natural way, was to start studying it. And from there, with the desire to write a poem, yes, a doctoral thesis has come out of it. And 20 years of research on ancient Egypt. Not bad, huh? as an aspiration to say, well, 
I'm going to see how this pyramid thing goes because I don't want to be certain when it comes to writing a poem. And from writing a poem, you go on to research. And that is what becomes your doctoral thesis. That's right. That's how it is in the most surprising way because for me it wasn't at all. That was far from being an objective for me. I mean, I was doing a doctoral thesis on Joan Martorelli Montels, who was Gordy's teacher. And I had all the research done on his work. And I needed to close it by writing specifically what is the text. The text, the guiding thread of the 60 or so works of this architect. And well, it turned out that when I found myself, that is to say, when I started working on the Great Pyramid, and I found to my great surprise that after searching for data and crossing data and starting to draw, I had come to the conclusion that the Great Pyramid was a pyramid. I had come to the conclusion that I had reconstructed it. I said to myself, this is much, much more important. And so I asked to change my thesis project. It was granted and I started working on it. It's not bad because I didn't know about it. I didn't know that you had already practically finished the thesis with the other thing, which is also a quite natural projection for a Catalan. Catalan architect to turn here nearby where we live in Barcelona. Of course, you have of at course. your disposal not only the information but the tangibility of it all. But I didn't know this. You just surprised me a lot by... I mean if you do an interview with me and I don't surprise you it's not worth the interview. That's the attitude. I, I have to keep you. some That's of no the letters. We'll if you know me too. so well then how we yes, met. Curious. You have a very curious look. But most of all, once you start investigating, you focus on getting the reconstruction of the exact shape of the Great Pyramid. To me, this, when I edit the book, that's where our meeting came from. I, well, if you want to explain it now, and we'll go on. Go ahead. Just so that, you know, we met in an impasse in my life when I was between jobs. I didn't really know what to do. And when you have time, what do you do? Well, you make the most of it or at least I try to, I try to. So what did I do? Well, on the back cover of La Vanguardia, the back cover of La Vanguardia always contains an interview that is usually very interesting. An interview that Victor Amela did with you. And of course, I was already very struck by the figure of Mikel in that interview. Mikel's figure in that interview. Besides, I had just read The Magicians of the Gods by Graham Hancock. I was, I think, in that dynamic, exactly. And then what happened? Well, I saw that he had published a book. I went to buy it, I read it. I was so impressed that I said, I have to discuss this with the author. I have seen that his architecture office is on the street. I won't say it now, but it's near my house, above. And at the risk of not being a stalker, I really promise it wasn't a stalker. I very politely wrote an email to your secretary. She answered me because you had already and from then on we started to meet, then a period of time has passed until we haven't met again. But here we are, doing a podcast, and look at the twists and turns of life. Life. Going back to the previous point, when I read, I remember that moment perfectly in my head, the first back cover of the book. E the first time that the pyramid is reconstructed exactly, and well, what's so special about it? What's so special about it? That's what I want you to explain to me. What's so special about it? The fact that it is reconstructed as you have achieved. Let's see, the Great Pyramid that you see now when you visit Giza is nothing else than the Great Pyramid that you see now. When you visit Giza is nothing more than a great ruin of what was initially the Great Pyramid. That is, the Great Pyramid was covered with a layer of limestone, a whitish stone, perfectly carved in regular blocks. But first an earthquake began to um, detach it from the internal structure of the pyramid and then it was used for the remains it was devastated by humans unfortunately by human beings unfortunately to transform it into a quarry from which bridges and palaces bridges and palaces were built in Cairo in such a way that nevertheless we have had the great fortune that a row of the original of the original covering on the north face that row of the original covering has given us the slope, the inclination. And then from there, as we architects have the habit of drawing everything, I said to myself, let's see if we have to do the reconstruction, we do it thoroughly. And what does it mean to do it in depth? It means going to all the sources that gave measurements, also taken by some architects, by engineers, by archaeologists, 
of the monument, and we're going to put it into the computer. We're going to put it into the AutoCAD program. AutoCAD program. And from here, as the program allows working with three, four decimal cybers, I said to myself, well, let's put four. And taking into account that the Great Pyramid has a unit of measurement, which is the real cubit, which is more or less this height, 52, 36 centimeters. Well, if it turns out that we are going to reconstruct it, we do it with four decimal cubits. Four decimal ciphers are tenths of a millimeter. But if they are half meters, they are twentieth of a millimeter. That is to say, the level of reconstruction was to take one millimeter and divide it into 20 parts, which gave us a little more than the thickness of a hair. So that gave us, gave us absolute certainty about what we were doing, and I'll tell you about it later. And I will tell you, you later in the, the corresponding podcast of Rediscovering Our Past, that uh, the monument itself, itself gave us first a certificate of its reconstruction, by giving us the surface view of the Great Pyramid, which was the first big surprise, the one that led me to decide that I had to analyze it in... me to decide that I had to analyze it in depth and to change the doctoral thesis. And the second big surprise was the presence of a mathematical formula that nobody has yet been able to decipher that certifies to you the absolute and exact reconstruction of the Great Pyramid. That is why I can speak with total and absolute propriety that what I have done is the exact reconstruction of the original model of the Great Pyramid, as it was designed by the Egyptian architects. Well, it is very clear that truth is that good explanation because it is an important point. Very important. To know to what extent the accuracy of the monument also then ends up giving you information that, as we will see later on, it is very valuable. Why no one had achieved it with such accuracy? Maybe they were waiting for me. Allow me the will. Let's see. It is clear that what happens is the following. Architects use absolutely precise geometrical and mathematical instruments. And of course, most of the work that has been done now at the archaeological level were also very precise. So we are talking about the exact survey that Flinders Petrie did at the end of the 19th century. Petrie did at the end of the 19th century. It is one of the most precise that has been done in the Great Pyramid and in Giza. But of course they didn't have the tools that we architects have today, which is the possibility of reconstructing it using computers. The possibility of reconstructing it through computers. And another of the issues that I think our profession contributes is that in a way we are the heirs of the geometric and mathematical knowledge used by the architects of ancient Egypt. Because think about one thing. The Great Pyramid, first of all, is architecture. It is a ruin, but it is a ruin of architecture. E. From there, I understand that we architects have things to say. Although I also have to add that without the work of 20, sorry, 20 of 200 years of Egyptology, in which archeologists and engineers have played a very important role, especially the work of archaeology, it would be absolutely impossible to have done the reconstruction work that I've done recently. Recently. Very well, it is to refer to all those who have... But you are, well, you are also touching on an issue that is also very important, which we will talk about later as well, which is the need for multidisciplinarity of everything, to understand the monument well. That is exactly right. It is. I mean, let's see. I have used multidisciplinarity systematically in the totality of the building, in the investigation of the totality of the building, because we have gone from the sciences to the arts with all the technological tools we have in between. Above all, because there is a theme that seems to me to be capital, which is that science is unique, it is unitary, in spite of the fact that, unfortunately, in our universities, it is fragmented. It is sad, for example, that there is no basic knowledge of mathematics in the arts degree programs and that the knowledge of the arts does not go beyond that. In science courses, in other words, I think that without this multidisciplinary approach, the work I have done would have been impossible. Not so much the work of reconstruction, the work of reconstruction is more specifically technical work, but the work of subsequent interpretation of what I had reconstructed 
and trying to get to the origins. To the origins, we are talking about rediscovering our past from ancient Egypt, which I believe is the great key to the research process carried out and which we will see, and we will see it in the development of the different podcasts. I also wanted to ask you about the aspect, once you have already reconstructed it with that precision of four decimal places, and you see it captured in that three-dimensional model in the computer, what did it look like? Well, by the way, you can see it if you want to. Here we have the book. This is the book that Mikkel published. The first of them. The first of them was self-published. Then LaRousse republished it. You can go to our web page and from there you can access it if you want to. Read it. You will enjoy it as I did the first time. But well, I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. Sorry, the web page is antigoegyptogesxi.com. Well, there you have it. That is ancientegyptxxi.com. That's perfect. This is what I wanted to ask you. You see it there already reconstructed. I imagine that on an emotional level, it must be something incredible, right? That is to say... Yes, especially because... Of course, you asked me a question before that I haven't finished explaining sufficiently. That is to say, the reconstruction... What is it about reconstruction? The reconstruction has something essential, something that had not been found until now, which is that the Great Pyramid was colonized by a sphere. So what allows the exact reconstruction is to understand that the Great Pyramid is nothing more than a solar symbol, is nothing more than a solar symbol. Remember that the Egyptians were worshippers of Ra, the sun god in his ashes. On the other hand, the Great Pyramid is a mountain, and if you imagine a mountain in its magical moment, it is when the sun crowns it. And in fact, the pyramids that crown the Great Pyramid, no, excuse me, the Great Pyramid, the other pyramids of Egypt, many of them have a winged, winged on top. What these gentlemen did was to put a sphere directly on top of it. So, of course, the excitement of seeing that this absolutely, absolutely new idea that the Great Pyramid was crowned by a sphere allowed its exact reconstruction, well, you can imagine. Well, it must be indescribable, right? I mean, this, nobody has seen it. I've only seen it for the first time. Earlier, we were talking about the possible, a little bit of the loneliness of the one who, maybe he discovers something that maybe he can't share too much either. And all this management of emotions must not be easy. It must be complicated. Complicated. So when do you start to realize that the pyramid is giving you something different, something that catches your attention, things that might seem anomalous? Might seem anomalous? Yes, the surface. Look, I'm going to anticipate it. The surface area was 100,000 times the number P in squared chotorals. And that, which we'll elaborate on in the corresponding podcast, represented anticipating by 3,000 years, the evolution of mathematics by 3,000 years, because it represented knowing the number pay to six decimal places. Subsequently, I gave the same model for reconstructing the Great Pyramid to the Great Pyramid to professors at the International University of Catalonia, specialists in 3D drawing, and there introduced a small change, which is that the vertex of the Great Pyramid was at 277.7.7777777 cotorealis. And I realized that I had to put the fourth one, it had to be a rounding, which was 277.7777778, because I had already done everything in four decimals. I had to round this one. And there it turned out that it came out, the number pi with one more decimal place. That is to say, with this reconstruction made by these architects, which was also a way to absolutely validate the work done. What I find is that there are seven decimal places in the number P, and that represents a thousand years more. So that the Great Pyramid is inaugurated in the year minus 2530, and the number pi with seven decimals is not achieved until the year 1500 of our era, that is 4,000 years later. Of course, imagine what this represents to realize that you are in front of a monument that is so unique, that has a plinth of one quatorial in height, which is what it is doing to you, is defining the unit of measurement. That gives you a hundred thousand times the number pi, with seven decimal places, and in addition, it ends up giving you a mathematical formula that what it does is to, is, certify the reconstruction. Do you remember that the number pi, 
is the ratio between the perimeter of a circle and its diameter. That is, if the diameter is 1, the perimeter is 3, 14, 16. To be exact, 3, 14, 15, 92, 65, etc., etc., infinite decimals. This had to be complicated to assimilate. I am yes, going to go over times. everything to see if I have not made a mistake. Several times, but of course it would have been a mockery of destiny. Of course it would have, have been. such a level of accuracy. And this is what leads me to the next question. When you add the end, this among many other things that we will discuss later on, but, but more and more things are appearing to you anomalous, in quotation marks, or that according to our knowledge of history, of history we have about how the Egyptians... The Egyptians lived, well, not how they lived, but the knowledge they had, scientists, you present the thesis before the court, and at some point you think, they are going to believe me? Well, that's precisely why I transform a doctoral thesis, because the information I had was so broad, and touched on different fields of science, mathematics, geometry, astronomy, and geodesy, for example. I said to myself, that is essential to transform it into a doctoral thesis, because if it is not, otherwise it will be difficult for to be believed by the public and especially by specialists. Finally, since then you have not stopped. You have been researching for more than two decades about the Great Pyramid and ancient Egypt and what they have given as a result. There are already, you have written four books apart from this one, pending publication. That's why we are publishers. Hello? But apart from that, how have you been able to reconcile professional life, personal life, this research, which, as I said, has been going on for more than two decades. How have you managed it, Mikel? Sleeping little and working a lot, there is no other way. I mean, you know what happens? Look, passion is another one of the engines of the world, if not the great engine of the world. And if you work passionately, you are happy. So, in a way, I've also built up my own happiness with this research process. Well, I think we are also happy. We are happy because we will be able to go more about all this in the next one. And don't let us down. In the next one, we'll continue in the second podcast. We'll continue commenting. Remember to subscribe to the channel. To subscribe to the channel, it would be very good for us. Like it if you liked it. And above all, also follow us on social networks. You will find it all in the description of the video. So thanks for being there and see you in the next one. See you next time then.